Hello friends, I'm Jill Morricone. I cannot believe it is the start of quarter number two. We're starting a brand new quarter for 3ABN Sabbath School panel. This is on three cosmic messages, which is all about the three angels messages. That's right, we're spending an entire quarter unpacking what those messages mean for us and their relevance for us as God's end time people. This quarterly was written by Elder Mark Finley, international evangelist, in fact, he's been to 3ABN many times, and he has a series on 3ABN by the same name as our quarterly, Three Cosmic Messages, and it's on the Three Angels Messages. He's an incredible student of the Word. He did a great job with this lesson, and we're looking forward to studying with you and with our family here. To my left, Pastor John Denzi, so glad you're here. It's a blessing to be here. I have Monday, Satan's Attack. Amen. In the middle, my sister, Shelly Quinn. Hi. What are you studying? I am so excited to be here. Mine is Accepting Jesus' Victory. Ooh, sounds excellent. Pastor John Lomacane. Mine is Wednesday, Woman in the Wilderness. Ooh. This is very insightful for the time it was written as well as today. Amen. Yeah. Last but not least, evangelist and singer in Israel. Pastor Ryan Day. Amen. Thank you so much. I have Thursday's lesson, God's End Time Remnant. Amen. Before we go any further, we want to go to the Lord in prayer. And Pastor John, would you pray for us? Sure. Let's bow our heads. Loving Father in heaven, to open your word is to step into a book that's far deeper than we are. Mm -hmm. And we are exposed to a mind that empowers us to think in a way that is spiritually guided. So we ask today for the guidance of your Holy Spirit, yes. for the beauty of your words to come alive in our minds and in our communication. And may through this study of Revelation, Jesus is clearly revealed. The three angels' messages is uh, spe specified in its detail and how it means and what it means to us today. And Christ is glorified. We ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. The lesson started with a great um, question, and I want to start with that. What happened in 1844? On October 15, 1844, Friedrich Nietzsche was born. Now, who is he? He's one of the most influential atheists of the modern era. In 1844, Karl Marx published the Economic and Philosophic Manuscripts of 1844, later led to communism. In 1844, Charles Darwin wrote one of his earliest expressions of evolutionary theory. Now, it wasn't published then. It was published later. On October 22, 1844, we have what we call the Great Disappointment Happened, where the Millerites who had gathered were looking for the second coming of Christ. But instead, it was not a disappointing day at all. They had misunderstood what was to take place, but they didn't get the date wrong at all. The fulfillment of the 2300 prophecy of Daniel 8, 14, Christ entered the most holy place and judgment would begin. This movement, the Seventh-day Adventist Church, would repudiate the belief system of Marxism, the belief system of Darwinism, the belief system of Nietzscheism, or however you pronounce that. The Seventh-day Adventist movement teaches that God is our creator. He created the world in six literal days while resting on the Sabbath. That's opposed to Darwin's theory of evolution. Mm -hmm. We believe that God not only exists, but he has a model code of character known as his Ten Commandment Law. That's opposed to Nietzsche's atheism. We believe the great controversy between good and evil will end in the supernatural establishment of God's eternal kingdom. That's opposed to Marxist, his man-made communist utopia. You see, the three angels' messages refutes not just the errors or the false teachings of those men, but many other errors today. They have at their core the gospel presented in the context of present truth. They are literally the marching orders of the Seventh-day Adventist Church. This week, we look at Jesus wins and Satan loses. You know, Mr. Danny Shelton always says, we've read the back of the book, and what does it say? We win. 
In this battle of the great controversy, sometimes it can appear that sin and Satan wins. Sometimes we feel feeble and we don't feel like, how can we get victory? Are you tired of the effects of sin? Are you tired of what's going on? Does it sometimes seem like it says in Psalm 73 that the wicked are prospering? Though we might be outnumbered, though it seems that the odds might be stacked against us, though Satan's attacks sometimes can be vicious, Jesus always wins in the end. That's the theme of Revelation. Jesus wins. Satan loses. Mm -hmm. The heart of this battle is outlined in Revelation chapter 12, which is the focus of our study this week. Let's look at a memory text. We're in Revelation 12, verse 17. Revelation 12, 17. And the dragon was enraged or wroth with the woman and went to make war with the rest of her offspring or the remnant of her seed. You can tell I memorized this in King James. Who keep the commandments of God and have the testimony of Jesus Christ. On Sunday, we look at that battle in heaven, that war that broke out in heaven. And we're going to verse 7 of Revelation chapter 12. I have those three verses. Revelation 12, verses 7 through 9. And war broke out in heaven. Michael and his angels. Now, who's Michael? Michael is none other than Jesus Christ himself. Michael, the name means, who is like God. He's identified as the chief prince in Daniel. He's the archangel of Jude chapter 9. He's the one who appeared to Joshua at Jericho as commander of the heavenly host and equated with the Lord himself. So Christ and his angels are involved in a battle with who? The dragon and his angels. Who's the dragon, Pastor Johnny? The dragon is none other than Satan. We see that in verse 9. The dragon, <clears throat> excuse me, is called the serpent of old, called the devil and Satan. Now, what is this war that broke out in heaven? I want to go back to Ezekiel chapter 28. Ezekiel chapter 28 we see this war that broke out. We see Lucifer, the covering cherub, begins a war in heaven. We're in Ezekiel 28, 14 through 17. You, this is speaking of Lucifer, were the anointed cherub who covers. I established you. You were on the holy mountain of God. You walked back and forth in the midst of the fiery stones. You were, what's that word? Perfect in your ways from the day you were created. It always confuses me. I don't think I'm ever going to understand this till heaven. How could sin arise where there was no sin? Mm -hmm. You know, for, for you and I, we're tempted because there's Satan. We're tempted because we have maybe hereditary tendencies to sin. But there was no sin. There was no tempter. There was no temptation. There was no hereditary tendencies to sin. And yet sin arose in that perfect world. You were perfect in your ways from the day you were created till iniquity was found in you by the abundance of your trading. That word is really fascinating to me. In Hebrew, it means slander, to go about from one to another, trading either goods or words. So this war in heaven is not a physical altercation. We're talking about a war of words, mm -hmm. a war of principles, Satan undermining or seeking to undermine the character of God. By the abundance of your trading, you became filled with violence within and you sinned. Therefore, I cast you out as a profane thing out of the mountain of God. Let's go back to Revelation 12. We read verse 7. In verse 8, we discover that Christ, Michael, and the angels are victorious because Satan did not prevail, nor was a place found for them in heaven any longer. So the great dragon was cast out, that serpent of old called the devil and Satan, who deceives the whole world. He was cast to the earth, and his angels were cast out with him. We know the dragon drew a third of the stars of heaven, right? A third of the angels were cast to this earth with Satan. Now, we're going to spend the rest of our discussion on the gift that God gave to you and to me of free choice. God's gift of free choice. Why were we created with free choice? I want to read you this statement, and then I'll give you three reasons from Jill. But I want to read you this statement from, it actually came from my dad. My dad loves to teach Sabbath school. 
Dr. James Penny. And when I asked him, I said, Dad, why do you think we were created with free choice? This is what he said. Fundamental to who God is, is his character. The chief or foundational characteristic of his character is love. Love has many supporting characteristics, but primary to all of them is freedom of choice. Thus, love never forces. Love has a direction. It is always outward to others. The object of God's action is always for others' benefit. Satan chose to change the direction of love to himself. All sin does the same thing. Instead of action for the benefit of others, actions now are for the benefit of oneself. No one in the universe understood what changes this sin would make. So God chose to allow sin and Satan in order to allow sin in action. But God also knew he would need to show through the life and death of his son Jesus that Satan's way was wrong and God's way was best. I love the way he put it because sometimes that concept is complicated and to take it down and break it down to that, I love that. I have three reasons in my remaining time for free choice. And first is God is love. First John 4, 8, God is love. Love never forces. If it were to force, it would become abuse. Reason number two, the foundation of God's government is love. God's law is an expression or mirror of his character. How do we know this? Think of Romans chapter seven. I love to look at these words, Romans seven twelve. Therefore the law is holy, the commandment holy and just and good. Now you say, Jill, that's talking about the law. That's not talking about God. If you look up Isaiah 5, 16, it says, God who is holy is hallowed in righteousness. Now here we see the law is holy, but God is also holy. Romans 3, 26, that he might be just and the justifier of the one who is faith in Christ. Now we see that God is just. So the law is just, but God is just. Luke 18, 19, Jesus said, why do you call me good? No one is good, but one that is God. Here we see God is good. The law is good, but God is good. We see that love is the fulfillment of the law. And we see that God is love. The law is perfect. God is perfect. The law is not burdensome. God is not burdensome. The law is righteous. God is righteous. The law is pure. God is pure. Mm -hmm. The law is eternal. God is eternal. The law is unchanging. God is unchanging. Right. If God is love and the law is an expression of his character, then God's law is love. And finally, number three, love allows the ability to choose. If choice were taken away, you and I would become robots. I think of Deuteronomy 30. I am giving you a choice, 30 verse 15, between good and evil, life and death. Choose life. The choice, my friends, is ours. Choose life. Amen. Amen. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Well, we move now to Monday's portion of the lesson, and the title is Satan's Attack. My name is John Dinsey, and it's a blessing to share this part of the lesson. And we see here that from the start, uh, Satan sought to destroy Jesus as we look at Revelation chapter 12. Uh, this is the great controversy between good and evil. And Satan has been in the attack ever since sin uh, originated with him. Let's go ahead and go to Revelation 12, and let's begin in uh, verse 4. <clears throat> His tail drew a third of the stars of heaven and threw them to the earth. And the dragon stood before the woman who was ready to give birth to devour her child as soon as it was born. This is what the devil does. He seeks to cause trouble. He created a war in heaven. And here we see that his tail drew a third of the stars of heaven, so he is not alone. He has a, about a third of the angels of heaven that sided with him, which is a, a, you know, it's one of those mysteries. How could they, in a perfect environment, the angels who loved God and turn and be convinced that they were not happy? You know, in order for somebody to join a rebellion, they must be convinced that they're going to get something better than they already have. So Satan is so deceptive that he convinced them, I'm going to give you something better than you have. So they joined the rebellion with him. 
And of course, they did not get anything better. <laughs> he deceived them. They were cast out of heaven. And eventually, this war came to the earth. But notice that it says there that he has these angels that do his bidding. And notice the way this is described. It says, to devour her child as soon as it was born. So ever since Jesus steps into the earth, Satan says, this is my opportunity. But the Lord was protecting Jesus as a child. Now it says in verse five, she bore a male child who was to rule all nations with a rod of iron and her child was caught up to God and his throne. This is obviously a reference to Jesus Christ caught up to the throne of God. Then the woman fled into the wilderness where she has a place prepared by God that they should feed her there 1,260 days, which is equal to years. And you'll hear more about that as we continue. Now we go to Revelation chapter 12 and verse 9. You see, the lesson has asked us to... Uh, Talk about symbols that are presented here in these verses that, we're, that we are reading. In Revelation chapter 12, verse 9 says, So the great dragon was cast out, that serpent of old called the devil and Satan, who deceives the whole world. He was cast to the earth and his angels were cast out with him. So as we look at the scripture, it says that the great dragon, that's the first symbol that the lesson asks us to, to talk about. The great dragon, who is he? The old serpent, also called the devil and Satan the great adversary of humanity. In Ephesians chapter 5, verse 25 to 27, we are told, Husbands, love your wives just as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for her, that he might sanctify and cleanse her with the washing of water by the word, that he might present her to himself a glorious church, not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that she should be holy and without blemish. Now, as you look at this scripture, it is making a, a, uh, a parallel between husbands loving their wives. But notice how Paul also says, as Christ loved the church. So the second symbol that we're asked to identify is woman. And notice how it says in Ephesians chapter 5, verse 32, this is a great mystery, but I speak concerning Christ and the church. Yes. So a woman in the Bible, in Bible prophecy, not all the time, in Bible prophecy represents the church. Uh, we have here in Jeremiah chapter 3 and verse 14, another scripture that helps us understand that this is the case. Uh, it says there, Jeremiah 3, 14, return all backsliding children, says the Lord, for I am married to you. I will take you one from a city and two from a family and I will bring you to Zion. So God is pictured as being married to the church. And this is why the woman is a fitting symbol of the church. Now it's interesting that you have to understand that the book of Revelation presents a pure woman Yes, as we see in Revelation 12, but then there's an impure woman also called a harlot as you continue reading in the book of Revelation. But this woman here in Revelation 12 is the church. Uh, so in Revelation chapter 12, we also see a symbol called the male child and we already identified that as Jesus Christ. Let's go to Psalms chapter two, verses seven through nine. It says, I will declare the decree the Lord has said to me, you are my son. Today I have begotten you. Ask of me and I will give you the nations for your inheritance and the ends of the earth for your possession. You shall break them with a rod of iron. You shall dash them to pieces like a potter's vessel. So the male child who is caught up to the throne of God is Jesus Christ. But here we have another symbol that we are asked to identify, the rod of iron. And the lesson brings something out concerning this that I now read to you from the lesson. Uh, Pastor Mark Finley. He says, in the Bible, a rod is a symbol of dominion or rulership. A rod of iron is a symbol of an unbreakable, unbreakable, all-powerful, invincible rulership. Jesus faced every single temptation that we experience, but he came off conqueror. The devil is a defeated foe. Christ has triumphed over him in his life, death, and resurrection. Because Jesus has already defeated the devil on Calvary's cross, we can be victorious too. Mm -hmm. Praise the Lord for that. Mm -hmm. Christ's victory over Satan was complete, but the great controversy between good and evil still continues. You see, 
the devil that attacked Jesus Christ and tempted him just like we are tempted is also after us. His attack continues. Mm -hmm. We're talking about the great controversy between good and evil. And you ask yourself, why is he still attacking since he is already a defeated foe? Right. Why does he continue this? Why does he just say, well, I lost. I better give up on this endeavor. Uh, but no, he continues because the Bible pictures him having great wrath. But there are other scriptures that help us understand how he is continuing. I move now to Revelation chapter 12. Uh, we already read verse 4, but I want to focus on his tail drew a third of the stars of heaven for a moment because uh, he is not able to be everywhere. So he has his angels that do his bidding, these evil angels that fell from heaven. Uh, concerning Jesus, notice Isaiah 53 verse 3. It says, he is despised and rejected by men, a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. And we hid, as it were, our faces from him. He was despised and we did esteem him not. And so question, whom do you think made sure that Jesus was despised and rejected of men? It was the devil. He worked in the minds of the men then present, even the leaders, the scribes and the Pharisees and the Sadducees, to despise and reject Jesus. Uh, the Bible makes an interesting statement concerning this. And it says that he is like a root out of dry ground. And they would look at Jesus and say, you're worthless. You're like a root out of dry ground. They despised and rejected him. But the Bible tells us, that Jesus remained faithful. He was victorious. Hebrews chapter 4, verse 15 says, For we do not have a high priest who cannot sympathize with our weaknesses, but was in all points tempted as we are yet without sin. He was constantly attacking Jesus. But Jesus remained faithful, and we, through his, through his victory, we can be victorious. In fact, I'd like to read to you from... Uh, Amazing Grace, a devotional book by Ellen G. White. It says, Christ was tempted by Satan in a hundredfold severer manner than was Adam and under circumstances in every way more trying. Mm. The deceiver presented himself as an angel of light, but Christ withstood his temptations. Jesus Christ withstood all his temptations. You know, you see in the Bible that he went to the wilderness and he was tempted three times. Jesus Christ was tempted far more than three times because the devil knew if he falls just one time, yeah. this earth is mine and the people in it are mine. Mm. So he made a relentless attack on Jesus. If he was wroth with the woman and went to make war with her, he made a war on Jesus unlike any other human being has faced, but he was victorious. But I leave you with 1 Peter chapter 5, verse 8. It says, be sober, be vigilant, because your adversary, the devil, walks about like a roaring lion seeking whom he may devour. His attack continues upon you and me, and we need to be sober and vigilant, trusting in Jesus, because he's already been victorious, and he gives us the power to be victorious, and we have his protection. Praise the Lord for that. Amen. Amen. Thank you so much, Brother Johnny. What an incredible study. Satan loses, Jesus wins. Right. I'm so grateful for that. Don't go anywhere. We're going to take a break. We'll be right back. Ever wish you could watch a 3 Abian Sabbath School panel again? Or share it on Facebook, Instagram, or Twitter? Well, you can by visiting 3 abiansabbathschoolpanelcom a clean design makes it easy to find the program you're looking for. There are also links to the Adult Bible Study Guide so you can follow along. Sharing is easy. Just click share and choose your favorite social media. Share a link. Save a life for eternity. Welcome back to our study on Jesus Wins, Satan Loses. We kick it over to Shelley Quinn and Tuesday's lesson. Thank you both for such a beautiful foundation to this lesson. I'm Shelley Quinn and my uh, lesson is accepting Jesus' victory. I just want to take a second. God does not give us prophecy to scare us. The revelation means Apocalypse, it's the unveiling in Roman, uh, Romans. Revelation 1, 1 begins saying, this is the revelation of Jesus Christ. Right. 
It is Christ revealed. The whole book is about Jesus. And verse 3 says, Blessed is he who reads and keeps the things which are written in this book. Let's back up from Revelation 12 to Revelation 5. I just want to say this. In Revelation 5, 6, John hears an announcement in heaven and he hears about the lion of the tribe of Judah who had prevailed, who had conquered, and who was the only one to, that was worthy to open this scroll that had seven seals on it. And that's an important scroll. He now gazes in prophetic vision and he sees a lamb as though he had been slain in Revelation 13, 8, you all know this. That's my favorite scripture. <laughs> is that Jesus is the lamb who was slain before the foundation of the earth. Mm -hmm. God always had a plan mm -hmm. that one of them would come down and become the person of Jesus Christ, the Messiah, the Christ. And his victory over evil forces was conquered through love, not through military might. So here's this lion of the tribe of Judah, now pictured as this little spotless lamb. I want to read what Mark Finley wrote in this paragraph. He says, as depicted in the Bible, Jesus has never lost a battle with Satan. He is the mighty conqueror, the victor over the powers of evil, the one who came from heaven to become the son of man, to become the covenant son of God was perfectly human and perfectly God. Mm -hmm. But he said, it is one thing to believe that Jesus was victorious over the temptations of Satan. It's quite another thing to believe that Christ's victory is ours as well. Right. Right. Let me read to you from Revelation 12 and verse 10. This is a great scripture. And this is John, he's still in prophetic vision. And he says, then I heard a loud voice saying in heaven, now salvation and strength in the kingdom of our God and the power of his Christ have come. For the accuser, of our brethren who accused them before God day and night has been cast down. Now, this is a time reference, a focus on time, and it's focus on the cross. Heaven is rejoicing. They have seen God's self-sacrificing love as he came down to become the person of Jesus Christ, to defeat the devil and assure of his coming destruction. The accuser of the brethren, by the way, is Satan. He is the one that's accusing mm -hmm. day and night, but his character was revealed mm -hmm. just by the complete juxtaposition of who he was and who Jesus was at the cross. Colossians 2.14, beautiful verse, but it says, Jesus made a public spectacle mm -hmm. of Satan and his unholy alliance of fallen angels, those demons. He said, triumphing over them in it. So Jesus wiped out the devil's accusations of our sins, nailed them to the cross, disarmed Satan and the principalities and the powers of darkness. Once again, Mark Finley says, when we accept by faith what Christ has done for us, our debts is canceled. We stand perfect in the sight of God. Our sins are forgiven and the accuser of our brethren has been cast down. We're redeemed, victorious and safe, not because of our own merits, but because Christ was victorious in our behalf. He prevailed. He won the battle between good and evil and his victory can be ours. His victory can be yours. Okay. Did you know we don't need to run around in frustrated defeat? Psalm 129 verse 4 
says, God is righteous. He has cut in pieces the cord of the wicked. Right. Whatever's binding you, claim that. You just say, oh Lord, cut me free from the cord of the wicked that binds me. Here's another promise of God's to claim. Romans 8, 37, I love this. Paul said, yet in all of these things, whatever's going on in the world, we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. Through Jesus Christ, we can be more than conquerors. In the original Greek, it means to overconquer, to triumph completely. Mm -hmm. And the battle against good and evil is going to rage until Christ returns. But we can overcome sin in our personal lives right now. We can have the assurance of victory in Christ. Here is a beautiful promise. Revelation 12, 11. I love this one. Mm -hmm. They overcame him, Satan and his unholy alliance, mm -hmm. by the blood of the Lamb. Mm -hmm. and, and that's Hebrews 13, 20. says Jesus' blood is the blood of the everlasting covenant, the covenant of righteousness by faith. They overcame by the blood of the Lamb and by the word of their testimony. Oh, let the word that comes out of your mouth match God's scripture. Speak God's word over your life. And they did not love their lives to death. Because of Christ's blood shed on Calvary's cross, we overcome when we accept him as Lord and mm -hmm. Savior. When we confess God's promises over our life, his promises will, his word will not return void, but he will accomplish. You can say, oh Lord, 2 Corinthians 5, 17 says, I am a new creature in Christ. Everything about me is new. Praise you, Jesus. You can say 2 Corinthians 5, 21 says, Jesus became sin for me. He who knew no sin became sin, that I might become the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. Right. Hallelujah. Philippians 1, mm -hmm. 6 says, you will complete the good work that you've begun in me because Philippians 2, 13, Lord, says that you work in me to will and to do your purpose. Oh, you can get so excited when you recognize who you are in Christ right. and the word tells you who you are. Right. Let that be the word of your testimony. You know, Christ made seven promises. Let me go through them quickly about to the churches, about overcoming by his power. Revelation 2, 7 to Ephesus, to him who overcomes, I will give to eat from the tree of life, which is in the midst of the paradise of God. Revelation 2, 11, to the church of Smyrna, he who overcomes shall not be hurt by the second death. Revelation 2, 17, to Pergamos, to him who overcomes, I will give some of the hidden manna to eat and I will give him a white stone and on the stone a new name written, which no one knows except him who receives it. Revelation 2, 26, to the corrupt church of Thyatira, he said, he who overcomes and keeps my works until the end, to him I will give power over the nations. Revelation 3, 5, to the church of Sardis, he said, he who overcomes will be clothed in white garments and I will not blot out his name from the book of life, but I will confess mm -hmm. his name before my father and before the angels. Revelation 3, 12 to the faithful church of Philadelphia. He who overcomes, I will make him a pillar in the temple of my God. He shall go out no more. I will write on him the name of my God, the name of the city of my God, the new Jerusalem, which comes down out of heaven from my God. And I will write on him my new name, mm. Revelation 3, 21, to the church of Laodicea, to him who overcomes, I will grant to sit with me on my throne. Accept his victory, be an overcomer. Amen. Claim Revelation 21, 7, he who overcomes shall inherit all things mm -hmm. and I will be his God and he will be my son. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Shelley. Appreciate that. Thank you, John. Thank you, Jill. Revelation 12, 6 and Revelation 12, verse 14 to 16 are the two comparisons that uh, Elder Finley asked us to look at. So let's look at that together, starting in Revelation 12 and verse 6. We read about this controversy. Then the woman fled into the wilderness 
where she has a place prepared by God that they should feed her there 1,260 days. Mm -hmm. So the Lord didn't say, find a place for yourself. That place that God sustains his people was prepared by him. And you, look, you study the history of what happened during the Dark Ages, what happened during the persecutions in Europe. Many literally hid into the dens and the rocks of the mountains to be preserved from the persecuting power of Rome. It became a, a very uh, monolithical power and sought in so many ways to wipe out the veracity and the, and the validity of God's word. And unfortunately, more than 50 million Christians lost their lives. Mm -hmm. Those who were sincere and held on to the truth the persecuting power of the church, led by the powers of Rome, led by the political, religious powers, persecuted God's people. But did the truth get corrupted? The truth never gets corrupted. The people got corrupted. <laughs> and so we find Revelation 12, verse 14 to 16. But the woman was given two wings of a great eagle that she might fly into the wilderness to her place, where she is nourished for a time, times and half a time from the presence of the serpent. So you see, once again, the duration of the time period in the wilderness is mentioned there, 1,260 years. She's there prophetically, you find Numbers 14, 34, and Ezekiel 4, verse 6 gives us the day for the year principle. You could check that yourself. But from 538 to 1798 began a dark period known as the Dark Ages, where the truth, people didn't own Bibles. The Church of Rome confiscated the Bibles. The bishops and the popes had the Bibles and in some senses chained to the altars of the cathedrals. So they had to believe what they were taught by the church. And what happened to the doctrines that were pure? They got corrupted. And the Bible talks about that. It says, there are those holding on. You have very few things left, but hold on. Don't let it go. And then he talked about one of the churches. You're existing where Satan's seat is, but you've been faithful. And you have a flame that's about to die, but, you know, don't allow it to die. God preserved his people during that time. But something happened during that time. Let's take a peek very carefully at verse 15. So the serpent spewed water out of his mouth like a flood after the woman, that he might cause her to be carried away by the flood. But the earth helped the woman, and the earth opened its mouth and swallowed up the flood, which the dragon had spewed out of his mouth. Let's talk about the flood for a moment. The flood is synonymous to the counter-reformation. You know, Martin Luther, Calvin, Zwingli, Huss, Jerome Wycliffe, these were men that came out of the corrupt movement of Rome. Martin Luther, very prominent, he was once a very significant part of the Church of Rome, but seeing the just shall live by faith, he came out of that and became a proponent of the truth of God's word. The just shall live by faith, not by the dogmas or the authority of the Roman Church. And others joined him in that movement to restore one tenet of truth after the other. But what did Satan's tactic become? Wash her away by how? The Counter-Reformation. Art and literature and science and math dominated Europe. Even the cathedrals became a place where the light show of the stained glass attracted the people to come into the cathedrals where they were corrupted by the doctrines of the church being taught to them. But God's church continued to prevail. The truth of God never got wiped out. The people got corrupted, but not the truth of God. And that's why the Bible says the earth opened its mouth and helped the woman. Now, in a future lesson, we're going to deal with the earth. As Revelation chapter 13, the second part talks about the beast rising up out of the earth. The earth that helped the woman was when God sent the church to America. That's the earth, the earth beast. It opened its mouth to help the woman. And so in the context of today and the history of America, we became a Protestant nation. Why Protestant? protesting the dogmas, the false teachings of the power of Rome. This nation is a Protestant nation, but it's metamorphosizing from Protestant to evangelical. And even those who began on the pure foundation of God's word are once again slowly being corrupted. You see the Sabbath corrupted in America. You see the truth about death corrupted in America. But where did it start? in the bowels of the Church of Rome and found its way into the pulpits of America. So, so much is being destroyed today. But what about God's truth? The truth has never been destroyed, but the people's minds have been corrupted. And so we see in Revelation 17, verse 3, just a picture very carefully. Look at that. The Bible says, So he carried me away in the spirit into the wilderness, and I saw a woman sitting on a scarlet-colored beast, which was full of names of blasphemy, having seven heads and ten horns. So what you see John's now looking at, he sees the woman go into the wilderness. He sees the woman as she became in the wilderness. But let me make a very important point here. You don't see God's truth 
being de uh, destroyed, you see the people's hearts being corrupted. But was there always a true and a false? Yes. Even before they went in, there was always a true and a false. God preserved the true, those allegiant to the unwavering word of God, those who only understood what they understood and remained loyal all the way through. So when they came out, there was not a new church and a new woman. That woman always existed, the true versus the false. And today we have that same picture, the true versus the false. The false is called the woman on the scarlet colored beast. The true is called the remnant, mm -hmm. the one who the dragon seeks to continue to persecute. And that's why the remnant are now described in the context. I say this with humility, the Advent message, mm -hmm. the three angels messages. Right. Where else is that being proclaimed other than in the Advent movement? God used reformers during the 1800s. William Miller, did he understand what we understand today? No, but what he understood, he proclaimed and he held to it. And so you see all of the trajectory of the truth coming back into its pure light. If it wasn't pure, let me make the, if it wasn't pure today, the dragon would not be attacking the woman. Mm -hmm. So because it remains pure, he seeks to establish his own movement the woman on the scarlet colored beast. Woman, a corrupt movement. The woman that stands with the stars and the crown and the light of God, the pure woman. And today there's an adversarial relationship between those who remain pure and those who still hold to that which is corrupt. How is it gonna happen? In the end, the truth will triumph and the corrupt will cease. Right. But let me make a very important point and I cite Shelley and Ryan in this particular. Where are God's people during this time? Mm -hmm. John 10, 16, other sheep I have that are not of this fold. Yes. What fold? The remnant fold. What fold? The commandment keeping fold. Them also I must bring. Did the God, did the Lord bring you? Did the Lord bring yes, you? Absolutely. And so God's people are still in these corrupt movements. Mm -hmm. But sooner or later, Revelation 18 says, the voice of the bride and bridegroom will no longer be heard in her. Before that time comes, what's the message? Come out of her, my people. That's Come right. out of who? not out of the remnant, but come out of the corrupt woman into the pure and unadulterated truth. So we praise God for that. So here are five takeaways of what the wilderness means in the scriptural context. One, the wilderness represents the journey between Egypt and Canaan. When the Israelites came out of Egypt, they were on their way to Canaan, but where did they travel? In the wilderness, Exodus 16, verse one. And they journeyed from Elam and all the congregation of the children of Israel came to the wilderness of sin, where are we today in the wilderness of sin on our way to a heavenly Canaan? Number two, the wilderness represents the process of leaving the past behind. Philippians chapter three, and I'll just give you a latter part of the verse. It says, verse uh, 13, brethren, I do not count myself to have apprehended, but one thing I do, forgetting those things which are behind. Did you forget the doctrines behind you? Did you forget the doctrines behind you? Mm -hmm. Yes, yeah. right pressing toward the prize of the open call of God in Christ Jesus. The wilderness represents the process of leaving the past errors behind and accepting the truth. Mm -hmm. Number three, the wilderness represents a place of refinement. Numbers 32 and verse 13. So the Lord's anger was aroused against Israel and he made them wander in the wilderness 40 years until all the generation that had done evil in the sight of the Lord was gone. When we get to heavenly Canaan, all the evil that is being done today, corrupted doctrines will be gone. Amen for that. Mm -hmm. And so we are in the wilderness still until we enter the heavenly Canaan. Number four, the wilderness represents a place of total dependence on God, Revelation 12, six. Then the woman fled into the wilderness where she is, where she has a place prepared by God that he should feed her there. Feed her what? The bread of life. That's who Jesus is. Jesus is still feeding the woman today from the unadulterated bread of life. And finally, the woman represents the place where God removes the distractions to make room for the worship of the true. Exodus 7 verse 16. And you shall say to him, Moses to Pharaoh, the Lord God of the Hebrews has sent me to you saying, let my people go that they may serve me in the wilderness. Here's my point. We got to serve God today in this wilderness setting of sin. We got to serve God today in the, in the truth of God's word in this wilderness until the day that we get into the heavenly Canaan. Don't give up the truth in the wilderness. Embrace it until the day that error is completely eradicated 
And what's the good news? Hebrews 13, verse 5, I will never leave you, forsake you, or forsake you. In the wilderness, God is still with you. Amen. Mm, amen. amen. Praise the Lord. Thank you so much, Pastor John. I'm Ryan Day, and I have Thursday's lesson entitled God's End Time Remnant. We're going to do a little bit more work based on what Pastor John Loma King just presented. We're going to go a little deeper and do some identification, some further clarification and identification on who this end time remnant is. This is the end, this is God's church. This is God's people. We want to make sure we are a part of that beautiful movement. You know, as it's been clearly presented here, the devil, like a flood, he pours out his wrath and his anger upon this woman, trying to snuff out, trying to destroy God's true remnant people who are all about the truth. Was he successful? No. Was he able to destroy all of them? No, even though it's very clear that he was able to, with that flood, take out many numbers. More than 50 million people uh, lost their life because of their faith, because of the truth that they believed. Uh, but out of this comes a remnant. And of course, do you think the devil's going to look at his work during the dark ages and go, oh, I failed. There's still some left over. Maybe I should just hang my hat up. Maybe I should just hang it all up and just retire. No, 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 no. He's on a suicide mission mission and he's going to go take out as many people as possible. So he turns his attention to this little remnant that's left over who's hanging on and holding on strong to the truth of God's word. We read there as it has been read a couple of times already, but we'll read it again in Revelation chapter 12, verse 17. Notice what it says. It says, and the dragon was enraged. He's mad. He's angry. He's wroth. He's upset. He is just, just on fire for the, about this woman. And it says, he went to make war with the rest of her offspring. That's what the new King James version says. King James version, I like it. It says the remnant of her seed. And then it describes this, this remnant who keep the commandments of God and have the testimony of Jesus Christ. Now, there are many, many identifications. In fact, I, I made a list years ago. There's many, many, many biblical identifications that we can bring up that just really just uh, dials in who this remnant is. But for the sake of time, I'm going to share seven very clear identifications with you. And we're going to look and back this up by scripture because the Bible is ultimately clear as to who God's people are. And we need not be confused on it. The first one I just want to bring out is that God's remnant is the minority that clings to the truth. Most of the time, it's the minority that clings to the truth, unlike the majority who compromises with error in the world. Uh, Matthew chapter 7, verses 13 and 14. What does Jesus say on the great Sermon on the Mount? He says, enter ye by the narrow gate for wide is the gate and broad is the way that leads to destruction mm -hmm. and there are many who go in by it. In other words the majority, the vast majority are going to be corrupted. They're going to fall by the way of error. They're going to take in the world. They're going to be corrupted by the world and false doctrine. But verse 14 says because narrow is the gate and difficult is the way which leads to life and there are few who find it. The minority. This is the case. This is not our mathematics on our own here that we're just creating this is a biblical uh, principle that's very clearly established all throughout the Bible. Even Jesus says in Luke chapter 12, verse 32, what does he say in describing his church? He says, do not fear, little flock. <laughs> I, just had to write, I had to bring that out. Do not fear, little flock, for it is your father's good pleasure to give you the kingdom. So we're talking about a minority in most cases. Also look at the time frame here. After this dark ages, we read this in Revelation chapter 12, verse 6. Pastor read this. The woman fled into the wilderness where she had a place prepared by God that they should feed her there 1,260 days. We even see it come up again in the latter verses of this chapter where it talks about the time, times and a half a time. This is talking about the 1,260 year time period of persecution in which the corrupt is persecuting God's people. The, tr the true woman, the woman who is hanging on to God's truth. And we're seeing here very clearly that this remnant, again we're identifying the remnant coming out of that persecution time period. This is post 17. 98. If you're looking for God's remnant people and you're looking for a movement that is hanging on to the truth of God's word, that's grounded in the rock of Jesus Christ and his word and his truth, then you need to be looking for a movement of people who post 1798. Now, again, I just want to reify or reclarify that God's people has always been. God has always had a people that has held on to the truth. But we're looking at from a prophetic standpoint, Revelation chapter 12 
in times prior to the second coming of Jesus, God has a remnant that's coming out of this time of persecution, this 1260 year time period of persecution. And obviously this is looking at the time period of 1798 and afterward. Uh, Revelation chapter 12 verses 13, five through seven, it says, and he was given a mouth speaking great things and blasphemy and he was given authority to continue 42 months. That's speaking of that corrupt system. Of course, we know that God's true system was in that time period, but comes out as a remnant post-1798. Our third identification here is that God's remnant people will be apostolic in belief and mission. Now let me clarify that because when you use the word apostolic, people think of Pentecostals or, or the charismatic Pentecostal movement. But the word apostolic simply points us back to the time of the early first century church when Christ has been crucified. And of course, Peter and John and the disciples, the apostles are now raising up the truth. They're raising up God's, uh, God's church. And of course, from the time that Christ was crucified until the end of the first century AD, the church just kept growing and growing and growing and growing to over a million people in that very short, you know, what it was probably 69 year time period. It was a powerful movement, but notice this, they were all united in belief and mission. So they were apostolic in the sense of they were a part of the original that Christ had led out and created in the beginning in the first century AD. And I just bring up a few texts here. Jesus says in Matthew 28 verses 19 and 20, go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all things that I've commanded you. Notice this is the truth of Christ. This is the word of Christ. If we're going to be a part of God's true remnant movement, we need to make sure we're teaching what Jesus taught. We need to make sure we're upholding what Jesus upheld, what Jesus represented, what Jesus preached. And that's what God's church will do. And of course, we also read in Romans chapter one, verses 16 and 17. Again, this apostolic age of the apostles, Paul here is, is, is uh, preaching here or writing. And he says, for I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God to salvation for everyone who believes first the Jew, uh, the Jew first and then the Greek for it is the righteousness of God revealed from faith to faith. And of course it says the just shall live by faith. So we are to preach that uh, salvation comes by, obviously we're saved by grace through faith alone, not of works as Ephesians chapter two brings out very clearly. But along with that, the apostles made it very clear that while they knew they were proclaiming a message and a mission in which people are saved by grace through faith, Acts chapter five, verse 29, Peter makes it very clear along with all of the other apostles, when they were asked, what shall they do? He says, we ought to obey God rather than men. This is an obedient people, which brings me to my number four identification. We see it right there in Revelation chapter 12, verse 17, when it says in Revelation 12, verse 17, that these people are those who keep the commandments of God. This is a commandment keeping people. They understand that according to Ecclesiastes chapter 12 and verse 13, that the whole conclusion of the matter is that we fear God and keep his commandments, not because we think it saves us, not because we think our salvation comes by any commandments, but only by Jesus Christ himself, but because we have been saved, because we are in a saving relationship with him. The result of that is a people who desire to worship God fully, to represent him fully and to obey him. That's why Jesus said, if you love me, keep my commandments in John chapter 14, verse 15. There's many other texts that I want to read on this, but you know, if you, uh, if you read through the Bible and we're going to read Revelation 12, verse or 14 verse 12, which talks about the patience of the saints, those who keep the commandments of God and have the faith of Jesus. God's end time remnant people. You can't separate it from the truth that God's end time remnant people are a commandment keeping people. Amen. And we see there in Revelation 22 that those who inherit the new kingdom, those who get to eat from the tree of life are those who do his commandments. Mm -hmm. Our fifth identification is that they have the testimony of Jesus Christ. We see there in Revelation 12, 17, that not only do they keep the commandments of God, but they have the testimony of Jesus. And in Revelation 19, verse 10, it clarifies for us a little further what that testimony of Jesus Christ is, as it tells us there in the latter part of verse 10 of Revelation 19, for the testimony of Jesus is the spirit of prophecy. And if you look at the parallel verse of that in Revelation 22, verse 9, it highlights for us word for word, almost the exact same words you find in Revelation 19. But the parallel that we see here of the testimony of Jesus Christ and the spirit of prophecy is equivalent to the prophets. God gives his message. He gives his testimony to the prophets. He speaks through his prophets. He brings about his last day remnant truth through his prophets. And if we have the gift of prophecy, then we will be surrendered and we will heed the message from his prophets as found in prophecy and by the Holy Spirit. 
The word testimony or testifies used eight times in the book of Revelation, and it always refers to the revelation given by God to his prophets. Our sixth identification is that God's people proclaims and helps people prepare for the second advent. That is the second coming of Jesus. We see right there in Matthew 25, it says, Behold, the bridegroom is coming. Go ye out to meet him. This is the message of God's people. We understand it. We recognize and discern the times. We're out there preaching the gospel according to Acts chapter 1, verse 8. When we receive the Holy Spirit, we go out and we become a witness for him to proclaim the goodness, the good works of God, and of course, his second coming. And then last but not least, our seventh and final point is that God's true remnant church, they're unpopular and they're persecuted. We see here in Revelation 12, 17, that he has went to make war with this woman, with the, with the remnant of her offspring. And it goes on to say here in Matthew chapter 24, verse 9, that they will deliver you up. They will obviously kill you and you will be hated by all nations for my name's sake, Jesus said. And of course, Paul writes in 2 Timothy 3, 12, that the godly, all those who will live godly in Christ Jesus shall suffer persecution. This is the identification of God's remnant church. Are you a part of God's remnant church? Put that to some thought. Amen. Thank you all so much, Ryan and Pastor John and Shelly and Pastor Johnny. Thank you. We're just getting started. I'm so excited about <laughs> this lesson. Give you all a moment for final thoughts. I would like to point out Jude chapter 1, uh, because the devil is as a roaring lion seeking whom he may devour. It says here in verse 24 and 25, Now to him who is able to keep you from stumbling and to present you faultless before the presence of his glory with exceeding joy, to God our Savior, who alone is wise, be glory and majesty, dominion and power, both now and forever. Amen. Thank you. I'm just, I was taking notes, Ryan. That was good. Jesus was victorious. Jesus is victorious, and that victory can be yours if you are in Christ. Romans 8, 37 says, In all these things we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. Amen. And uh, during this time, the woman in the wilderness, we are in the wilderness still, but what sustained her? God fed her. Here is your safety. If you feed on God's word, John 6, 48, you will get to know who the bread of life truly is. Feed on God's word Amen. and Christ will become real to you. Amen. God's remnant people will proclaim his second advent. We see it there in 1 Thessalonians 4 when it talks about Christ coming. But in verse 18 in 1 Thessalonians 4, he says, Therefore comfort one another with these words. We should be proclaiming those words to each and every one of us. Amen. What an incredible lesson. What a start to three cosmic messages. The incredible last day message of the three angels of Revelation chapter 14. Jesus wins. Satan loses. I'm so grateful that Jesus is victorious. Make sure you join us next week. We're just getting started. Next week, lesson two, a moment of destiny.